Thank you, Arpit. Hello, everyone. My name is Sharaman, and I'm one of the engineering leads at the uh, Meta Connectivity Group. And I'm very glad to be here to talk about Metaverse and uh, Metaverse Ready Networks. All right, so um, let me just go back a little bit in time and uh, talk about when, uh, when Meta used to be uh, Facebook, started about two decades ago. Basically, most of the text that, I mean, most of the contents that people shared were, were mostly text. And over the last decade, what we saw is that a lot of the contents moved from text-based expressions to a much more photo-based uh, photo and uh, image-based expressions. Right, right this minute or, or the last couple of years, it is a lot more video-based shared. We're sharing all sorts of videos, different forms, shapes, and, and, and fidelities. We believe going forward, people are going to share a lot more immersive contents like AR and VR contents. And, uh, and, and, and that's gonna happen over the next few years. And that is precisely the path to metaverse from, from our perspective. So let's see what exactly is metaverse. Metaverse is a set of digital spaces where people can come together and do things together regardless of their physical distance. And it can allow you to do things in a very interactive and immersive way whether you play games or have uh, meetings, like we are having this one on, on Zoom per se, uh, and, and we're all um, looking at it from different places uh, on the planet, whereas you could probably be, have the feeling of doing this together. Um, you can play, play games, you can do fitness, you can learn things, you can do lots of different things together. And, and when you do those, uh, it might feel that, okay, does it mean it's an, it's an alternative to the, our physical presence or things we do physically? Absolutely not. It's a lot more about what we already do online better and much more meaningful way. For example, you could actually teleport a friend or a family member uh, right into your living room and have a, have a conversation as if the person was here. Uh, in reality, the person could be actually on the other side of the planet. So that is the vision of Metaverse. So towards that vision, what are we doing at Meta today? There, is, there are so many different things that we're doing for sure, but I'm just gonna go ahead and highlight a few things that should kind of, kind of show us like how we are progressing towards, uh, towards that vision. Uh, starting with the left-hand side, we have the Horizon World. This is, uh, the Horizon is, I would say, Meta's first iteration or release of the of what metaverse is going to look like it's a place where you can we can create things you can uh, you can meet with strangers with with lots of uh, you know uh, personal boundary and other features so that you can your avatars are really really safe in that space and 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 you can really uh, be in a world create your own world create lots of different things in in that world so that's like a horizon stories we have the Raven stories, which is more um, um, or for smart glass, the a pair of glasses basically that we launched with Raven last year. And this is where you can you can you can take photos, videos, you can take phone calls, you can listen to music and do some of these things that were uh, that were previous, previously not possible without just uh, something like a, something like a phone, for example. So that's Raven stories. We have avatars. We have now been creating photorealistic avatars for the last, uh, last couple of years. And we've released the, the, the set of that last year, which is uh, basically the number of combinations that can have with the various parts uh, and, and the pieces of, of yourself, which is a much more expressive, is, uh, is basically quintillion or one and 18 zeros following that. So I can't even imagine how big the number is to be frank. So that's kind of, that's the avatars. It really helps us express better and represent our, us in a, in a digital world. Last but not the least, we have Oculus, Oculus Quest. And this is the virtual reality headset that Meta has been building uh, for many years. And uh, Quest 2 release went out last year. It, it provides you the ability 
to fully immerse yourself into a virtual world with uh, six degrees of freedom and, and, and controls that's, that's, that does not require a PC or anything else. Uh, it's a standalone VR headset device. So there's really a lot, a lot of different things, but these are four things that worth highlighting that are already out there and, and playing the role of uh, what, uh, what a metaverse would look like over the next, uh, next few years. So moving along, let's, uh, that, if that's metaverse, I would like to talk about, which is a lot more relevant to this, uh, this crowd, is the, is the metaverse ready networks or the concept of the metaverse ready networks. What exactly is that? Now, this is sort of like where we are today. And uh, majority of the global um, cellular traffic, well, excuse my, uh, my, my slide snuffle there, uh, today is, is pretty comfortably can achieve what we see on the left-hand side, which is the today's video calling. So the expectation for, for what today's video calls uh, stand at about 5 Mbps and 150 millisecond end to end latency. And that, that works fine with the current network today. Uh, from there, when we move to the tomorrow's cloud VR, which requires less than 30 millisecond and 20 Mbps of bandwidth, we start to see a problem. And, and the problem is that this network that, that was sort of like most of the networks, actually, I should say, around the globe has been built and, and has been upgraded and uh, much more optimized towards. Uh, greater speed and greater bandwidth for going with that, that evolution of the content that we, that we saw. And suddenly when we start needing a, a lot higher quality of experience, a lot higher service level objectives for SLO, and that demands the network in unprecedented ways. And this is where, these are just the two use cases per se. And when we think about some of the more demanding use cases, uh, you know, mobile cloud gaming, desktop cloud gaming, VR meetings, it, it just becomes very obvious that it, it is going to be quite challenging and the networks are gonna need quite some upgrade to, to, to get there. And uh, since 2013, Meta Connectivity has been partnering with the industry and partnerships uh, with several in, in, in infrastructure investments, network analytics, and we have improved the state of connectivity together for more than 300 million people around the globe. In order to support more immersive experiences and uh, be able to really uh, deliver on the promises of the metaverse, we will continue to provide the tools, share network equipment, identify customer and geographic segments with the highest needs. Our mission is to accelerate the evolution of connectivity in order to help build, bring metaverse to life. Okay, so. so. And we firmly believe that better connectivity is gonna be a key across, you know, a key enabler of metaverse across the physical world, augmented reality and virtual reality. I'd like to share to that note, uh, the, our vision of the future networks. We should be a continuous evolution rather than adoption, rather than I would say the, the generational advancement that we have seen uh, a good part of the uh, you know, for, for the past couple of decades, if you pair that up with the evolution we're seeing on the content and the, and the people experiences side, right? And as we think about different technologies, whether they're Wi-Fi, 5G, fiber, cable, or satellite, first and foremost, we believe open and open source technologies, there should be only increased usage and adoption of those technologies where Linux Foundation plays an, an important role in the industry especially with several projects with LF networking and LF edge that are uh, helping uh, and, and would, be, would be sort of very important for our mission. Next, we need to evolve the network architecture to support private and decentralized networks. And then we have, we, we are seeing that movement of many network operations and back into the cloud. We're seeing more network services move closer to the edge and um, application of AI ML techniques better management operations and other aspects of the network and, and a variety of key features, spectrum innovation, support for network slicing, scalable low latency network protocols, improved quality of service, better congestion control, buffer management and active queue management, rendering of, um, of graphics from, from the cloud and so on. Quite a long list to be, to be frank. 
Last but not the least, it'll be awesome to have standardized ways to measure quality of experience and service level objectives for immersive experiences as the industry that we believe that getting the ecosystem to come together um, is, gonna, is gonna help us innovate better. To that end, we'd like to establish a shared network readiness vision, define the new approach to QOE and SLO, and then really spark a flurry of network innovation on the ecosystem. So at the end, as with the internet, no one company will own or operate metaverse. Rather, it will, must be built on the foundation of openness and interoperability and be accessible to as many people as possible. The metaverse will demand a fun fundamental shift in how the networks are architected deployed today. Open and open source technology will play a very important role in this evolution. We need to more a stronger, more secure, robust, scalable open source projects up and down the stack across the network. As Meta, we are a long-time advocate of open source technologies and continue to work with LF communities. As RP pointed out, one like eBPF, uh, we've been a very um, strong proponent and participant of that. Presto, Magma already are in the community and we many more should follow. We, sh we would love to see many other companies participate, contribute and support projects that we believe will be critical elements on our path to Metaverse. We're excited to collaborate with the industry in solving these connectivity challenges, and we highly value our partnership with Linux Foundation. We look forward to working with you on establishing that shared network vision for network readiness for Metaverse, defining new measurements, i.e. QoE and SLO, with standardized APIs to access those, measure those, share those. And finally, fueling innovation in the open source ecosystem. With that, my call to action is to come build with us. Thank you, everyone. Back to our Pete. Oh, that, that was great, Sean. Um, okay, perfect, perfect. Thank you very much. That was like uh, a very, very good vision um, of, of what you have done. And uh, I think the, the implications, because people have been hearing metaverse, metaverse, right? Like it's, again, there's the marketing aspect of it, but then there is the actual, what does it mean to the, the connectivity and the network. So, you know, really excited about, about you translating that into kind of real projects, the dependency on open source. And again, we thank you for the leadership. Now, there are some questions. Uh, the, the, the one that has come in is, what is the lowest latency you have achieved in your tests so far? Uh, you know, given that you know, there's, there's, there's the 5G that is coming on, which will get you one tenth, but then there's the edge, which can get you up to anywhere between, you know, less than 20 milliseconds. But what, what are you seeing from a latency perspective? That's an excellent question. And before I, before I get to that, Arpit, it's, uh, I just wanted to at least start off by, by sharing that. Uh, yeah, there could be a lot of marketing hype and buzz around metaverse in the, in the industry, and that's totally understandable. When it comes to what we're doing at Meta, for us, metaverse is very, very real. We're working on a, a number of different initiatives that you're seeing that have already come out and they're just going to be more and more coming out later this year um, and going forward. So that's the first, first part. Now, coming to that specific question about the latency, it, it really depends on, on a couple of things. One is that what is the use case and the specific application that we're looking at as different applications are different latency requirements. And, uh, and the other thing is that the networks around the world are really built in, in different ways. We see different results depending, depending on where we're running the test for those applications. So if we take the combination of, let's say, um, cloud gaming experience with, uh, with deployed in the North American networks, we can probably get to 80 to 100 millisecond range uh, pretty comfortably and, and those tend to work pretty well. You take the same, um, same sort of experience in other parts of the world where we have cloud gaming um, enabled, we start to see a lot higher latencies, like start going up over 100, 200 to 250 milliseconds. And that starts impacting the, the services quite a bit. Then when it comes to cloud, uh, let's say uh, meeting experiences, uh, there's a similar story. There are cases that we have reached, we've achieved close to 50 millisecond. Um, and, and that has, uh, but that's I would say too specific to the question, that's probably as low as we have gone. And to help us with that, what we started doing is that started segmenting the network according to their latency needs, whether they're you know, they can tolerate higher levels of latency. There are places 
there are applications that they can tolerate higher levels of latencies, where there are others who are a bit of a mid-range, and then they're the really the lowest latency that, are, that we're looking for. The short answer is that uh, it's, it's around 50 milliseconds from as far as I know. These tests are very ongoing, and, and depending on in what scenario you test them, you might go to for some sub 50 second milliseconds, sub 50 milliseconds as well. I'll stop okay. there. And, and I think I, I hope that answered I, the question. Yeah, no, I, I think it did very well. And I think um, the dependency, uh, if, if, if I may, I think the, the, these applications and, and these real use cases are just going to accelerate you know, technologies like 5G, which drags latency down, uh, accelerate technologies like edge compute, which again, uh, closer, you know, giving resources closer to the applications. And, and just the adoption of kind of more open source because these things are being built on it. So really appreciate uh, exactly. the insights there. And again, uh, there's one final question before uh, we wrap, but uh, uh, what does networking look like among edge data centers versus centralized distant data centers? Do you, do, do you use IP multicast? I know this is fairly technical. Uh, yeah. If you can answer in short, uh, that'll be fine. Yeah, I can just share a very quick insight on that. So our edge networks and, and our data centers obviously have the, what we call our, our backbone network are, are, are running and they're, they're there. Uh, the short answer is that I'm not aware that we use IP multicast today and I'm not sure that if it actually makes sense to connect uh, you know, edge data centers with our, with our main data centers. Uh, it is really just a, uh, just a pretty traditional uh, backbone with a lot of uh, uh, innovation that we have built at Meta for example, it's all uh, it's all IPv6. Um, it it goes over our own uh, fiber for most parts. There are there are some cases that we leverage public fiber as well. So uh, yeah, that's the short answer. Yeah. yeah, and we have seen at least here in US, uh, there's tremendous push for fiber all the way. So yeah. you know that will also help. I think I think awesome. it's great to bring technologies, uh, networks and applications all together. And I think this is a great vision. So thank you very much for, for covering this, Sasha. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks.